feeding garden birds. Where do I start? Well, we'll start with the garden. And uh, what is a garden? Well, I'll tell you a very, very brief story. This is an aerial view, uh, probably not a garden bird view. They don't normally fly quite so high uh, of Cove. And this is where my house was. Uh, the only grass we had uh, in our house growing up was any that might have grown in the gutter at the top of the building. So I grew up uh, mad keen on birds and wildlife, but no garden. And I got a bright idea when I was about nine or 10 to set up a bird table in a green area that was out the back. Now, as you can see, it's quite a distance from the house. So anytime I had to fill up a peanut feeder or a put seed out, I got a bit of exercise. I had to go out, go out of the house, walk around the street, up a couple of flights of steps, down through the trees to the edge of the, of the green area. And I'm sure if my mother knew uh, exactly where it was, she would have had a heart attack because there was a wall, I'd say, well, to me, it, it, it looked at about 50 feet high, but it was probably about 25 or 30 feet high. And I had the table right there on a branch on the edge of the woodland overhanging the top of the wall. And then I would come home and I would look out one of the back windows of our house and I would watch the bird table with my binoculars. So uh, I started off with extreme feeding birds, uh, I think is what you'd call it, extreme garden bird watching. Gardens that attract birds can come in all shapes and sizes. It can be a small garden like this, a patio garden. It doesn't have to be a huge rambling area. It can be neat, tidy. It, it, in fact, it could be all concrete with, with some uh, shrubs or plants in tubs and, and that's enough to get you started. Obviously a general garden like this you have more diverse habitat and you, you will probably get more species in a garden like that. It's all about gardening with nature. Very very important uh, and the more habitats you can put in your garden the, the more species you get. For some of you who might be very keen traditional gardeners this might look like a jungle, uh, but to me, it, it's whatever grows in the garden, I let grow. And if it doesn't grow, I don't try and force it to grow. And as a result, we get amazing wildlife. And we're in a suburban garden, by the way. We're not way out in the countryside. OK, so you can get birds coming to feeders and into your garden to feed almost anywhere. And when you do provide the diversity, you end up providing food for them. So there's more to feeding garden birds than putting out food. You are also indirectly feeding your garden birds when you provide uh, suitable habitats and the environment which gives them the food they need, especially when a lot of their habitat uh, has been removed or destroyed over the decades. And here you have a young robin, which might fool a couple of you. When they're just out of the nest, they don't have the red breast. And it's after catching an insect there, an ichumen fly uh, in the garden. So it, I think by providing habitat might be enough. You, you, you know, if you don't want to put out food, you can do this. You can, you can build your garden. There's loads of information online about ways of doing it. You get birds like the song thrush who will feed on the snails, you know, and that's, a, a fantastic uh, sight to see uh, is the song thrush hunting in the garden. It mightn't be great for the snail, but I know for a lot of gardeners, they don't particularly like snails if they've got hostas or something like that. Uh, but what you've got to avoid, really, really avoid, are these harsh chemicals. Uh, again, there's loads of information online now of using, you know, nature friendly ways of controlling things that you want to control in your garden. OK, it, you don't have to go to the heavy duty chemicals, N not anymore. Uh, you shouldn't have to. You really shouldn't. It does require a, a new style of gardening. You know, it really does at times. Uh, but I, I would strongly advise these seeds. The dandelion. Some of you might have heard about this during uh, lockdown or during our restricted movements. People were encouraged not to mow their lawns so often, especially late April and into May, when birds uh, are starting to nest or are in the middle of nesting, you can provide seeds like dandelion seeds, which are, you know, really a great natural source of food in the garden. 
And teasels are another one. And this photograph I took from inside the window of our house. Teasels are often used in, in uh, dry flower arranging as well. But, but we always keep them under control and we always make sure we have a couple of plants of the teasel growing in the garden every year. And goldfinches like them in particular because they have the right shaped beak to get in at the seeds that are inside these very prickly seed heads. So again, by gardening for nature, you can provide the food. And what a stunning sight. I mean, if, if you're only new to uh, the garden bird watching and feeding birds, well, you know, it, there's years of endless fun in store for you, for sure, with minimal effort. Berries, put in berry bushes and fruit bushes uh, for the birds. Because please remember, God in her infinite wisdom or his infinite wisdom created berries so that the trees could spread their seeds by birds eating them. I've heard of gardeners complaining of birds eating their berries. The birds are only doing what the plants want them to do, and that's take the berries. Interestingly, a plant like a honeysuckle, which gives beautiful flowers, a lovely scent, also has these fruit at the end. And this year I noticed in particular this fantastic bullfinch was coming in and eating the fruit. And in fact, even today, there are still some fruits left on the honeysuckle. And bullfinches in particular have been taking them in the garden, though I have also seen blackbirds uh, trying to take them too. Hawthorn, a great tree to plant if you've only moved into a house. Great plant to put in. They don't grow very big. They're not a very big tree. They're like a large bush or a small tree. Beautiful flowers in May, white flowers, loads and loads of them. And then you get these red berries as well. And this is a bird to look out for this winter that likes the hawthorn berries. It's the red wing. They don't breed in Ireland, but they come to us every winter from places like Iceland and Northern Europe. They really are a fantastic bird with the red underneath the wing. And uh, when we had the last severe spell of snow back in 2018, a lot of them came, came to Ireland and we had them, lots of them in the garden. Uh, but they love the hawthorn berry. Rowan is another one you can plant. It can grow a bit bigger, but in most gardens uh, where you see rowans, uh, they actually grow quite small. And I think you can get varieties that don't grow very big, but they provide, again, lovely berries. Holly, fantastic, native, brilliant, brilliant food. And uh, there's a few birds that get quite possessive about their food supply in a garden. And the missile thrush is one of them, bigger than the song thrush and paler and colder in color but they will often guard a berry bush during the winter and chase off uh, other birds that come to try and feed on it. They're a bit more pot-bellied than the slimmer song thrush, and here they are together. So keep an eye out for that. That's the missile thrush on the left, and they will come and take the berries. Song thrushes will take some berries, but not as much as the missile thrush or the red wing. Ivy is fantastic, much maligned, but an amazing plant all year round for wildlife, both for insects and for birds. And uh, they're, they're really fantastic. The fruits on the ivies in the winter often attract this bird. Some of you might find it unfamiliar. It's called a black cap. It's relatively small, about robin sized. Uh, the male has a black cap, but the female has a chestnut cap. And they're warblers that spend the summer feeding on insects and a lot of birds change their diet from the summer to the winter. In the summer, they're raising young uh, and laying eggs and they need lots of energy and they tend to move over naturally to feeding on high protein, fresh diet, such as insects. In the winter, when insects are scarce, their diet becomes a lot more varied and that includes berries. Pyracantha is another one. I took this only last week and uh, this blackbird was in polishing them off. Fantastic to see. There was seven blackbirds in the Pyracantha. Uh, I hadn't seen so many in, in a year. Uh, some years you don't get so many. I think when there's more food away from gardens, the birds are slower to come in to the garden uh, for food. Uh, but this year they were really gulping down the, the, the berries. It was a fantastic sight. And there's a female trying to trick you, looks like a thrush. And in fact, blackbirds are members of the thrush family. Tony Aster is another, another one that you, you often see, and you get a lot of birds feeding on those berries. And here's one I want you to look out for this winter. 
a bird that comes all the way from Northern Europe and Siberia, when food supplies run out there, it's called a wax wing. It's got little red waxy looking bits on, on, on the feathers of the wing. That's where it gets its name. But you won't miss that. It looks like a bird that has escaped, some sort of tropical bird, but it's called a wax wing. And they, they, they usually breed in Siberia and Northern Europe. But when the berry crops fail there, they move west and they sometimes end up in Ireland. So keep an eye out for them. That's the beauty about feeding birds in a garden and setting up your garden with plants for birds is that you, you may be you know, gifted with a, with a, a visit of, of these magnificent visitors from the east. Don't have your garden too, too tidy. Leaves are a very important source of food. A lot of uh, insects uh, and worms and things will, will be found under these leaves. So uh, we always leave a, a number of patches of leaves on the ground in the garden. This is a blackbird, which isn't totally black because it has a condition called leucism, where some of the feathers have no or little pigment. Uh, but it will root away under these leaves throughout the winter to get food. Because even when the ground gets frosty, they can move away the leaves. They, you'll see them flicking leaves left and right, looking for worms and insects to eat. So please, please try and leave a patch somewhere in the garden where, where you can leave leaves uh, out, where you can leave leaves. <laughs> Sorry about that if I'm confusing you. But yeah, leaves very important in the garden. You don't have to leave them all over the place, but reserve a couple of patches for leaves and let them there over the winter. Water, not exactly food, but important, very important. Uh, even a tiny little, uh, what people often call a bird bath like this, would be, would be very important to put out uh, all year round. In fact, I find sometimes I have more or as much activity around the water as I do around food I put out. Uh, so if you don't want to put out food, you can still attract the birds in by having water available. And we have all shapes and sizes of water receptacles out dotted around the garden. Uh, some of them can be moved, so if you want to leave them out for the winter and then move them in the summer, you can do that, like this, this particular one here. This is another one. It, it's a bowl. Uh, my wife Anne made it. Uh, it was a second. You can see there's a bit of it broken, so perfect for birds to wash in. They'll come in to wash in these as well as drink. Very important that you clean out the water every few days, at least once a week. You don't want it getting too dirty, um, but for most birds, it's fine. Uh, but there's no harm. And don't have a receptacle with vertical sides on it. They don't like diving into water. They don't know how deep it is. And none of these birds can swim. They're land birds. So you want something with a nice gentle slope. You can use a dustbin lid turned upside down and put up on a slant. And that, that works very, very well too. And of course, you can move that around and you get lots of visitors. And if you're into photography, brilliant because they have to come there to wash. So all you have to do is sit and wait. You do need lots of patience. Some days they'll come in very quickly. Other days they won't. And it's a great way of seeing them. I put in this one a few years back uh, and just a piece of cement and uh, just made a slightly bigger uh, water feature. And then you can go the whole hog. Now, I only took this shot yesterday, uh, so it's, it's not looking as bright and colorful as it might in the summer. But... This pond uh, has everything, lots of insects, all sorts. And you get from the very small birds coming in to wash and drink to the medium sized birds, right up to the large birds. And yes, I love magpies. Folks, don't make baddies out of magpies. They just do what they have to do. There is no scientific evidence, evidence to suggest that they kill all the small birds and that there's none left or there's none around. No evidence for that. Take one step back from nature and observe it in all its wonder. Without the birds like the magpie, the whole system falls apart. Uh, they're part of the system. They're part of what makes it so amazing. Uh, and they're beautiful birds. And with a big pond like that, you get wood pigeons coming in, the doves, all of them come in, and it's fantastic to watch. Nest box, uh, while you're providing food, you can always provide a, a place for them to nest. The members of the tit family in particular like to nest in crevices at times, such as uh, here's one in a wall, a stone wall. 
So a nest box with a hole in the front can provide a suitable home for them. There is no guarantee they're going to actually use it, but you can do your best and you can move it around every couple of years if there's no sign of them using it. Sometimes it's best to just put it up, ignore it, and eventually all of a sudden you'll notice there's birds actually using it. And it might be one, two, three years later, have patience with a nest box. Uh, by the way, on the birdwatchcork.com, that's our branch website, uh, we have up there for downloading uh, an information sheet on nest boxes and how to make one, okay? So you can do that. Great tits, we'll use them. I, we even got a wren one year to come in to the box. And there's mom or dad with all the, uh, the little ones peeking out. So uh, it's always a great sign that your garden has plenty of food nearby if they nest there. Uh, one thing about the nest box is remove the old nest. You can do it now, November, December. Uh, birds that would normally use a nest box would be finished with it. Sometimes birds will use it in the winter um, for um, uh, just to roost, but normally you can take out the nest in midwinter because birds generally won't use, small garden birds in particular, won't use a nest box two years in a row. Normally they won't do that. So clean out the box. You can even give it a dousing in, you know, a disinfectant or a mild 10 to 15% uh, uh, dilution of, of bleach and let it dry out and it's ready to go for next year, okay? Now we get down to actually putting out food for birds. I just talked about gardening for birds and I'm sorry if I'm moving fast, but um, I'm trying to cover a lot of ground here, okay? So putting out food for birds is the next step. And it's generally in the winter that we think about doing it. Uh, people ask me, can I grow food all year round? Uh, the answer is yes. But in the summer, you'll notice that you don't, go, you don't get so many birds coming to the feeder. And the, and the reason for that is they are moving over to, to more, more um, uh, sort of high protein insect based foods usually. And once they've raised the family, they're out and about. But as the winter days get shorter and shorter, which we're nearly at the shortest day now, uh, and the weather is, is severe, uh, there is less chance for these birds to, to find food. And as I say, because of habitat loss and everything else, uh, the pressures that we've put them under uh, by, by living our lives, I think it's, it's a great way to give something back to the birds in some way. And they will reward you then with, with lovely color and activity and action when you can't go outside. Even if you can't leave your house, the birds will come and uh, put on a show. It's really fantastic. Uh, but yeah, you can feed them all year round. I usually reduce it to a small amount of peanuts in a metal mesh feeder during the summer, just in case they've got a week of bad rain, heavy weather where they can't find insects and they can't hunt they can tie themselves over. But I wouldn't put out a lot because again, in the summer, they, they, they'll go off. The, the things, food will go off quicker in the summer. Uh, this is a lovely goldfinch I took during the last snows, uh, again, from the window in the house. And during the winter, a lot of the young birds will not make it. If every bird, garden bird that was born this year survived uh, for the next two or three years, we would have millions and millions and millions of garden birds. The reason they have so many young is because uh, only a few will reach uh, to be breeding birds and adulthood. So again, as I say, there is no harm giving them a little bit of a help throughout the winter, as I say, just, just because they do find it a bit tougher at times. The peanut feeder, this is the easiest one to start with. These are peanuts. When you're looking at your peanuts to buy them, Make sure they're not all shriveled up uh, because often if, if they can't be sold, a dealer might keep them for the following year. And if they dry out, the, the energy value of them goes way down and you're really not then putting out uh, good food for them. So check that the peanuts look reasonably decent like these ones and that there's, there's not mold on them either. Uh, you know, keep an eye out for that. So to get started, here's a simple setup. And I've repurposed, chopped up uh, an old clothes stand uh, to make this, this hanger for the feeder. And this is a simple and easy way to get started. 
peanuts in a mesh feeder. You can get fe mesh feeders all over the place. You get them in supermarkets, garden centers, in a lot of places. And it's a lovely little present for someone to get started. A nice little Christmas present, not too expensive. Um, one thing I do is I take the bottom off these feeders. They often have a plastic bottom. They catch water. The peanuts will rot, especially if it's been raining. The first thing I do is take the bottom off and then I, I crimp the mesh flat and fold it over once. That way it drains out all the water and the birds can get at those peanuts down at the bottom as well. And it's much healthier for them. So you put it out and you hang about and you're waiting and you're waiting. It, they might come in an hour, but please don't give up hope if they don't turn up uh, even two or three days on. The birds are always looking about for new food supplies and eventually they'll find it. And that's what happened with this one, came in this morning, uh, blew it. And before long, you'll have a steady stream of visitors. And again, even if you're in a suburban, highly built up area, you'd be amazed if there's a green or a park nearby within flying distance, uh, they, they will eventually find it. And as you can see again, I've taken the bottom off the mesh and I've, I've crimped it and folded it so that they can get at it. Last count over the years, I've had uh, 14 different species of bird come and use the peanut feeders in our garden. So don't worry if you think you're only going to get blue tits and nothing else. You'll be amazed what sort of birds will come and try. So you've got blue tit, you've got the great tits, which are slightly bigger, the coal tits, you get all the members of the, of the tit family coming in. You get long tail tits. And usually if you see one, stop whatever you're doing and wait because you may get this. They often go around in the winter in big groups and here's a photo my son Peter took through the window. And if you look carefully, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight birds on that feeder. And our record is 14. Uh, lovely little birds. And they disappear as quickly as they come. So you never know what's going to turn up. That's, what, that's the beauty of putting out food for birds. It's really brilliant. Green finches, uh, you'll get those as well. I'll come back to them later. Gold finches. How stunning a bird is that? Uh, siskin with its lemon colouring. Uh, you often get them later in the season. They, they nest in, in coniferous woodlands and usually they move into gardens and suburban areas towards the end of winter. But some of them have been turning up early this year as well. That's the siskin. And then there's this one, which was the cover for the, uh, the poster for the talk, the bullfinch. Uh, you, get, you can get those coming in as well to the peanut feeder. House sparrows, I think they're fantastic. Beautiful, beautiful birds. Uh, the dunnock, normally uh, found on the ground, but sometimes uh, you get them up on the peanut feeder. Starlings, the black cap, like I mentioned earlier, they will often move between the ivy berries and the peanut feeder. They can be very aggressive and territorial. I mentioned birds chasing off other birds from their food supply. Black caps can be a bit like that. Then you can get bigger birds like the jackdaw. We haven't had one for a couple of years, but we used to get jackdaws coming to the peanuts. And I know my sister, uh, Margaret, who feeds them regularly, she had one that used to turn the feeder upside down and pour all the peanuts out onto the ground. So beware of the, the, the crows. And you might even get a squirrel. Now I'd love to have squirrels on my feeder here. But sometimes you might want the bigger visitors coming to the feeder. Sometimes people prefer just the small birds. Uh, I don't mind what comes uh, to, to our feeders. They're all great. I find I get great pleasure watching the antics of all of them. But if you, if you find that this is a problem, uh, then you could buy a, a, a feeder like this. So the smaller birds can get through, but bigger birds and the squirrels can't. So again, if you look online, there's an awful lot uh, of new designs and clever ways uh, that you can get uh, these feeders to suit whatever type of birds you want to, to have. Uh, seed dispensers is another one. Uh, they come in different shapes and sizes. I put this one on the bird table. I shortened it so that I could put it in under the roof. And these are goldfinches that come in uh, to take the seeds from the dispenser. Different types of seed. Niger seed, 
mixed seed. This isn't a great example because sometimes these mixes are have loads of filler in them that aren't really great for birds. Sunflower seeds is another one. So you've got different seeds that you can put out in these dispensers. And believe it or not, if you have no garden at all, and there's some greenery not too far away, you can actually try one of these window seed dispensers. It's their suction cups go onto the window and the birds get used to it. I remember someone had one for quite long. They said they never had a bird hit the window, which can be a problem, but you can try it. And obviously if birds do start banging off the window, then you'd have to move it and try it some on a different window. But that's a lovely little way. If you're, if you're somewhere, you might be living in a flat on a second story, or you might some, know someone who is, and it might be worth a try. Takes them a bit longer to get used to it because they're coming right up to the window. But once they do, you can watch them at very close quarters. Seed cake is another one. This is uh, the way I put it out. Um, this is what you need to make a seed cake. Uh, you need some fat, and then you need some seeds. And I use old Chinese takeaway containers to, to use as a mold. But you could use um, an old milk or yogurt carton or a juice carton. And what you do is you melt under a very low heat, uh, you melt the fat, then remove it from the heat, and then you mix in the seed. I use one part fat by weight uh, to two parts of seed. You can always just let the fat come to room temperature and put the seed in uh, into a, a pot and just mash it up together and then use a spoon and you can put it into something like a, a yogurt carton with a string on it and hang it up. Don't put out seed cake in late spring, summer and early autumn uh, when the days are warm uh, on average uh, because the fat melts and it gets stuck on the bird's feathers. It gets stuck on their beak uh, and they can't get it off because it's, after, it's all melting and sticky. So really only use seed cake uh, during the winter months. And yeah, again, if you put it out just like this and you hang around, you'll get birds coming to that as well. And again, you'll get all sorts coming to it. This one is a cold tit with a characteristic white stripe down the back of the head. You have gray tit, blue tits, starlings again some people don't like them but how could you not like a bird as beautiful as that they are stunning absolutely stunning and i find usually that the starlings are later to get up in the morning and a lot of the smaller birds have got in had something to eat and are then ready to go and the starlings come later and you will even get birds that are not normally found up on peanut or seed cake feeders like uh, this robin this robin in the garden has gotten used to coming to the seed cake as well uh, during the winter. And there's a lot of high energy in it for them that will get them through those short, cold winter days. Don't put out seed cake or uh, fat balls, as they're sometimes called, in these plastic mesh uh, containers. Uh, unfortunately, small birds can get their feet entangled in the netting and they've been known to die sometimes overnight if they get caught late in the day and you don't spot them uh, and they'll be dead by morning. So please do not use this plastic netting uh, when you're putting out seed cake or as I say fat balls as they're sometimes called. You can buy seed cake or fat ball dispensers. Uh, they come in different shapes and sizes. Um, and you can even make your own with a block of timber. If you know someone who can drill uh, out some holes, maybe about 50 millimeter uh, in diameter, and you can stuff the, the mixture of seed and fat into those holes, and you will get birds like this female black cap. She has a chestnut cap instead of a black cap, uh, a name just to confuse you when you're starting your garden bird watching. And they will come and they will feed on this. So you can get very creative uh, in, in how your uh, seed uh, cake dispensers look. But I, I prefer this one. I made these myself with a few lengths of old bits of timber. And then I bought some 12 millimeter wire mesh. Uh, and this seems to work best uh, for the birds uh, of all sizes. This is a cold tit that, that comes to it regularly as well. Uh, the bird table then, this brings everything together. 
if you want the, the full experience, buy or make yourself a bird table. This is one during the uh, Beast from the East. That was right in 2018. And uh, here you've, you've got green finches, you've got gold finches, you get the tits coming in with everything uh, coming and going during that time. The beauty about the table is that it has a, a roof on it and that keeps things dry and it keeps things from blowing all over the place. And, and then, of course, you can put hooks on it to hang peanut feeders and seed cake. In this case, I have the seed cake in on the table itself. And the beauty about that over just putting out loose seeds on a table is that they won't blow away. When they're in the seed cake, they, they stick together and you don't get seeds being scattered all over the place uh, as well. So this is my setup after 50 years of trial and error. Uh, as I say, you remember, I used to have to go around. I made my table, hung it off a branch, and I had to go go all the way around in, in Cove in town uh, to, to check it out. Uh, but I made it myself out of scrap wood. And this, to me, is my ultimate bird table. It doesn't look like much. Uh, there's a PDF of this design with all the details and some notes and instructions on the birdwatchcork.com website. If you go to the um, publications a page on our website you'll find a pdf that you can download and you can make your own table and you don't have to be a master uh, craftsman uh, to do this a good friend of mine who is a master craftsman john o'hearn and balan Nakora made this one for me but it doesn't have to be the birds aren't fussy but the beauty of it is i can have my seed dispenser i can have my seed cake and my peanuts you know all there ready to go if possible, place the table, you know, fairly close to the house. You want to be able to see the birds. I've been in gardens where people have had bird tables and they're, they're miles away. Uh, and I know there may be an issue with wanting to use the, the lawn in the summer or whatever, but you can also, you know, construct the table with a, with a base on it, which will allow you uh, to move it if you need to move it uh, in the summer. Uh, so that's what I would say. Get it as close to the house as you can. And uh, also, if possible, within two or three meters of a tree or a bush, uh, because the birds, uh, they, they're always on the lookout for danger from, you know, sparrowhawks or whatever. And uh, as a result, uh, they like to have somewhere where they can retreat to where they feel safe. And that would be a nearby bush or tree. And so you get a lot of traffic coming and going. What's very important about the design that I've, I've realized over the years is that you don't want the roof too high off the table. If it's too high off the table, it might as well not be there. It's more like an ornament. And if you want a bird table that's mainly ornamental and not very functional, that's grand. But if you want to keep everything dry, uh, you know, uh, then and make sure the, the roof is very, very low. In fact, I have about a five centimeter or two inch gap uh, between the roof and the table which might seem very low to you, but it keeps it dry. And it also actually deters bigger birds because I know some of you may have crows coming to your garden a lot. Well, this can deter them. If you put a bit of wire across the, the open end at the bottom of the roof, it's all in the instructions on our website. That, that will deter them quite a bit. Also, if you want to keep out animals, you might have a cat, you might have squirrels, you might have other furry animals that you don't want coming up to the bird table. You can put a baffle on it. It's like a, a cone. You see them on ships, uh, on the ropes. Uh, but but that, that is very effective uh, just in case you don't want animals climbing up onto the table. On the ground, I don't put stuff on the ground so much unless it's very hard weather and I'll put out some seeds. And here you have some linnets and goldfinches that came to that during the last snow. But birds on the ground under the table, if there's any scraps coming off the table, robins uh, will, will feed down there. Chaffinches will come in down there as well. That was the male, this is the female. House sparrows will come in down there. The dunnock uh, will also spend a lot of time on the ground under the tables and you can put out food on the ground, but it's harder to control uh, and keep clean as well. As I said, you've got to keep all these areas clean. Uh, you'll get the doves, they like to be on the ground, although they'll also come up onto the table. You'll get feral pigeons or racing pigeons coming in. You might even get gulls like this black headed gull might come into the garden, depending on where you live. Then the crows will also come in, jackdaws and rooks. And people often don't like uh, the crows. Again, the magpie, what a beautiful bird and much maligned 
please don't sort of demonize this bird. It doesn't deserve the reputation that it has. And they come into the garden. They're quite shy, actually, uh, magpies. But if you want to keep out those bigger birds, the crows and that, here's an idea where you can either put an upside down old um, shopping basket uh, or you can make one up. I, I made one up from an old uh, fire guard once the kids got old enough. Uh, and, and that can keep out the bigger birds, but the smaller birds can get through. Feeding hygiene, very, very important, folks. Very, very important. Uh, it, diseases can spread, not very often at all, but very important. Wash your feeders, bird table, and grow feeding area if you can, at least once every week or every two weeks. Use a, a mild bleach, a 10 to 15% concentration of bleach or a disinfectant, and then make sure everything is dry before you put in new nuts uh, or you start putting seed out or whatever. But try and do that if you can. There is one parasitic uh, disease uh, that the birds can get called trichomoniasis uh, or trichomoniosis, sometimes it's called, and finches get it. And green finches have, have got it badly over the years. And, and when one is sick, you can go right up to it. The feathers are fluffed up and it gets very wet looking around the head and it, they can't feed. And most vets will tell you that there is no, little or no way of saving these birds. Uh, so if you come across one like this, first of all, just stop feeding, take away, take down all the food, clean all the areas and leave it for about three weeks. I know this can be tough when you've gotten so used to seeing the birds coming and going to your feeders or your feeding area, but leave it for about three weeks and then put everything back up again and start again and you should be fine. It, it happens very rarely. But if it, if it does, stop feeding and thoroughly clean uh, your feeders and your feeding area. This will prevent the spread of the parasite to other birds. You can't get the disease from them. There's no cases of con cross-contamination. And it's a very rare occurrence. So let, don't let it put you off putting out food, okay? Hazards in the garden, very briefly. This is not a hazard and it's not a baddie. This is the sparrowhawk. It's the, it's the hawk you're, you're going to see most often in a garden. And it will take some of the, the smaller birds, but as, as with the magpie, it's all part of the natural system. It may not be pretty to see one take a bird in the garden, but they keep the whole natural cycle lean and mean and beautiful. So please try and step back from nature and, and let them do their thing. Uh, another hazard is reflections in windows. Sometimes birds, especially younger birds in their first winter, get confused. And when they look at a window like this, they think they can fly through to the, they see the sky. And of course they bang into the window and they get stunned. Sometimes they'll die. If they're only stunned, put them in a box. You don't have to put them next to a radiator, folks. They're covered in feathers. They don't need to go anywhere too warm. Somewhere dry, maybe in a cold shed, uh, you know, uh, or cool place, uh, but you don't have to put them next to a radiator. It'll kill them. Uh, and if they're stunned, they can look like they're dead sometimes, but amazingly, Lazarus-like, they'll come around in maybe an hour or two. Uh, so don't give up totally, but sometimes they do die. And if you're finding birds like that directly below windows near your feeding area, uh, then something like this might work. We've had these on our windows, a couple of our windows, uh, where we did find that goldfinch dead many, many years ago. And we put on these little silhouettes. You can get them from the Birdwatch Ireland shop. You can check them out online, birdwatchireland.ie. And you put these little silhouettes on and the birds then can see that, that it's, it's not a way through, that, that it's, it's actually solid. And they're, they're less inclined to bump into the windows. Uh, that's one thing you can do. Sorry, no folks, for anybody who has cats, but these are the by far, way and by far, the biggest threat to garden birds uh, anywhere in the world, and Ireland is no exception. They are not part of the Irish ecosystem, and where they've been introduced, they've even been the cause of the extinction of a number of species around the world. They are beautiful animals, I love them, but it is possible to have a cat and not have all your birds being you know, a target of the cat. A bell and a collar, that's a good start. It definitely will help. Birds can hear the bell, but they're not that great. Uh, for me, 
something like this is what you have to use. It's Birds Be Safe, an American product, or, or something similar. And these are brightly colored collars with colors that can be picked up specifically by the bird's vision, which in actual fact is not the same, not quite the same as human vision. And if your cat wears one of these, it can reduce the deaths and maiming of birds by 89%. When you put this elasticated, just like the, the bell and, and, and collar, it's elasticated and it breaks if it gets caught in something, breaks off. But the cat is hugely visible and cannot creep up on any birds in your garden. But you can have a cat and feed birds as well. But you must do all you can to make sure that that cat is not taking birds because how many dead birds is a cat worth? Citizen science, very briefly, do the Irish Garden Bird Survey. It starts Monday, the 30th of November, but you can join in anytime. You can do it for six weeks. You can do it for the whole 12 weeks. Every week and every observation will be very valuable to us. You can go to the birdwatchireland.ie website and you can, for free, you can join our survey which has been running since 1987. You can submit your records and your sightings online, or you can download the form and you can fill it out. It's a great thing for the family. Or if you're on your own, it's fantastic. And you learn loads about all the birds that come into your garden. You don't have to be an expert uh, to do it. And it's really great fun. Very simple, easy to do. From it, we have gathered a vast amount of very valuable information about our garden birds. The beautiful J, for example, numbers have been climbing incredibly. And this is all due to people doing the survey every year. And we've noticed that they're appearing in gardens more and more as years go by. And this woodpecker, the great spotted woodpecker, new to Ireland as a breeding bird, arrived first on the east coast of Ireland. And uh, thanks to the garden bird survey, uh, we've started to see a pattern of them expanding uh, slowly south, north and west uh, from the east coast and hopefully soon they'll be turning up in a garden near you. You can't miss this bird, it's, it's about the size of a blackbird, uh, fantastic, a, a woodpecker. Top 10 birds in Irish gardens, number one is the robin, number two was the blackbird, number three is the blue tit, number four is the chaffinch, Number five is the great tit. Number six is the magpie. Number seven is the goldfinch. Number eight is the house sparrow. Number nine is the wren. And number 10 is the coal tit. As this survey is interested in birds using gardens, even if you're not feeding birds, you can still take part in the survey uh, and just look out for uh, any birds that happen to be going about their business in your garden. And finally, get yourself a notebook. You don't have to be an artist. You can get down a lot of information about any unfamiliar or mystery birds uh, that you see in your garden. And then of course, you'll need uh, a good guide to attracting birds to your garden, uh, identifying the birds in your garden. And I guess I'd have to recommend Ireland's Garden Birds. If you are going to buy a copy, please buy it from the Birdwatch Ireland online shop. Proceeds will go towards the conservation of birds in Ireland. And you can also get it in all good bookshops. Uh, you should also consider at some stage getting a pair of binoculars. Uh, you can get a really handy pair uh, that will be perfect for watching your garden birds even closer than you can with the naked eye and they're well worth having. Uh, I would suggest going to the Birdwatch Ireland online shop uh, as the first port of call when thinking about buying a pair. Uh, you can also email them, they'll give you advice because one thing Birdwatch Ireland does very well is binoculars. They're the tools of the trade for any bird watcher. So you'll get the best advice and you'll get a pair of binoculars that will suit your needs most definitely. And soon you'll be going out to bird watch and not just watching the birds in your garden. So with that, folks, I'd like to thank you all for sticking with, with me, those of you who are still out there. And um, I hope you enjoyed it. Check out our website, birdwatchcork.com to download information on bird tables, nest boxes, and lots more. And check out birdwatchireland.ie. You can join our organization. 
uh, help us conserve Ireland's birds. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed. All right. So uh, there was a question, Jim, with regard to uh, nest foxes. I know you said it's covered yeah. already. Um, and sorry, I got to pull down through this here. Is what's the best? What's the best location and direction for a nest box? Okay. And also, in addition, that was from Albert. Okay, Albert. Well, uh, good question. Uh, it is covered in our PDF download from the website on how to position your nest box. It, it varies a lot. I've had boxes facing in all directions and they've had birds in them. But the best way to start out is face the box away from the prevailing wind. So between north and east, I find is, is the best. Um, because if you get you know unseasonal rain and wind during the breeding season, it's not blowing straight into the nest box. Uh, sometimes it might blow the lid off if you don't have it on properly, stuff like that. Between north and east. But if that's not working, uh, I think try anywhere you can. If it's a nest box like the one I showed with a hole in the front, put it somewhere clear for starters. You don't have to stick it into a bush. It can be you know, on a pole, it can be on, on, on the, uh, the clear trunk of a tree, it can be on a garden wall, uh, you know, and, um, and make sure it's at least seven, eight feet off the ground. You know, again, you don't want, um, you, know, um, you know, I have to say it, cats in particular, uh, you know, getting easy access to it. But between north and east, Albert, it would be the direction I would start with. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, there's a, another one, which is, um, I, it's, it's to do with what size should a hole be in the nest box? I guess that's covered by what we have on the, on the website. So one yeah, after is, that. It yeah. is covered, Tom, yeah. But generally, uh, 28 millimeter will, will do your, your most of the tit family. If you go higher than that to 32, it ish you'll get um, off the top of my head you'll get house sparrows and you start getting starlings as well uh, but again uh, try and go to our website and if you can't email us and we'll, we'll direct it toward to to you to it and you can download all that information okay so the next one was how do i stop the crows from figuring out how to get the food from feeders and scaring off the rest i know you had a little bit about squirrels yeah. not getting in yeah yeah yeah, it's, I mean, they're, they're you know, I, I don't like comparing humans to animals when it comes to intelligence. We, it's a different intelligence. You know, you can't compare the two in some respects, but they are very clever by our standards. They are so clever. And, and the way to do it is, as I say in the bird table, for example, uh, that, that design, which again is available online, the very low roof, they don't like being in sort of, confined areas too much but it's fine for the smaller birds they don't bother with it at all uh, and that can help but also like i showed you there if you get like a squirrel proof um feeder there's loads of them online uh, that that should help or if you've got a table if you get in old money it's like one inch or uh, like sorry two inch um mesh uh, you know uh, chicken wire mesh and put that around the, the, the openings on, on a bird table or make a dome of it, uh, of the mesh. Uh, you can do it by hand, it doesn't. And, and that, put that on it, the crows can't get in and the small birds can. For feeders, uh, it's a whole other thing. If you can get a very sensitive elastic, you can try that if you're at your wit's end. Uh, because if it's really sensitive, like even elastic bands and that, the, the small birds are too light and they can land and feed but if a crow lands on it it's too heavy and it bounces all over the place and they usually don't like that perfect two questions the same one from rory and uh, from orla what type of fat do i use from the fat cake and yeah, there was a it, comment as well made by somebody from mary saying children love making seed cake yes yes i mean it involve all the family i made slight references to that throughout um yeah, the, the type of fat I use, 
I use ordinary lard, but I have also used, if you want to go vegetarian, there are vegetable substitutes. Uh, they, they sometimes aren't quite as solid when they, when, when they go cold, uh, but I use just ordinary lard. Um, it's a 250 gram little block. You can get Frytex or you can just get, you know, not yellow pack, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, and don't boil it up. It, it, it denatures and everything. Just just slowly melt it and just mix away. Uh, and that's what I would use. Yeah, it doesn't have, it's nothing special. Okay. Um, this is from Siobhan. Um, if Jim doesn't cover the subject, could you please ask which is better? I have a cat mafia, about seven cats. Yeah. Probably my small urban garden. I think I know what they're going to be wearing. Yes. Uh, is it better to put feed out for birds in case they're killed by the cats or risk it because it's better to try and feed them? So. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge dilemma where you have a lot of cats and um, a lot of people still think that everybody loves their cat. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough one. I, I, I would just, I would put out food uh, if you, the minute you see one being taken or you find one injured or maimed in your garden, I think you're going to have to stop. Uh, I, you know, deterring them, you can buy electronic deterrents, which apparently uh, scare off mammals, the, the, the pitch of the sound and that. I, I don't know whether they're good or bad or cruel or not. Um, it can be very, very hard with, with, with lots of cats around. Um, uh, you didn't hear this from me, but a super soaker is a very non-lethal way of getting rid of some cats. <laughs> very good. It might okay. be worth the try. And if you get a good powerful one, you get quite a distance on it. And the cats know that even, they'll eventually learn that when they even see you, they'll run. Uh, and that can help. And you're not hurting the cat, uh, but at least you're getting it out of your garden. Uh, so that, uh, I, I, that that's worth a shot. Okay. From Gronje, can you recommend brands of birdseed? Recommending brands of birdseed, I would suggest go to the Birdwatch Ireland website. Uh, they both sell it and you'll see it there. Uh, C, I think it's CJ Birdseed is another one that, that I know. Uh, a lot of these companies are English. Um, uh, they, they're, the, they're the only ones I know. I, I tend to go by just feel, to be honest, when I see them. Um, but in a lot of places, especially the bigger store, bigger pet shops and that, and you ask specifically for a wild bird mix, not a cage bird mix, uh, you'll get the, you'll see the grains. They're like, they're like grass seed heads and stuff like that. Like some of them have like peas in them, you know, like, you know, dried peas and that. No bird will eat one of those, you know, they, they have to be fresh. So, and as, as, as Tom's, you know, you get filler, you get filler in them. We were talking about it earlier. So things like that, uh, CJ Birdseed, uh, or check out the birdwatchireland.ie website in the shop section and you'll get an idea of what sort of seed they have uh, and if you can't get it from them because you'll be supporting conservation if you do buy it from, from Birdwatch Ireland at least you know what to look out for Okay, great uh, This is from Jeffrey. Can we encourage the winter insectivores like say the tree creepers who aren't interested in seeds or nuts putting out mealy bugs for example? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I didn't even get to cover that. As you can see, it's, it's quite a topic to cover in, in, in less than an hour. Um, mealy bugs, yeah, you can get them from uh, fishing shops and stuff like that, or mealworms, they're also called. Uh, that's live worms. That might be everybody's uh, taste in, in putting out food for birds, but that will work for sure for some birds. But what you can also do, I, I, I've heard uh, that what works is you can put out a kind of a cheese and fat mix. And if you've got a tree that is good for tree, which is one with a bark that's not smooth because the tree creepers want to look for the insects in all the nooks and crannies. So like beech trees aren't the best for them because they're often quite smooth barked, but oak and stuff like that is. But if you, if you a little patch, if you actually push the, the, the cheese mix into the, into the grooves, that the birds will, will come along and feed on those too. In general, it's just potluck with uh, attracting tree creepers is, is uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I might look it up online and find a way to do it, but I'm not aware of, of a way of attracting them 
easily uh, to a garden. Okay, you asked about the woodpecker and somebody has just left a, a comment here. Uh, it is Grania to say, I saw my first woodpecker in my garden this year in Donegal. Fantastic. Donegal. I mean, they're moving all over the place. They, they were yeah. first seen, uh, I think it's about 10 years ago. I, I might be wrong. I, I, I can't remember the exact, but very recently on the East Coast and the, every year they've been spreading and spreading and the garden bird survey uh, is starting to show up uh, patterns uh, and uh, very valuable information for, for, for observing how our bird life is changing with the times. Okay. Uh, from Suzanne and from M. Walsh, two comments. One fantastic talk, a delight for the gardener's heart. Also, thanks for giving Corvids a much needed press. But <laughs> M. Walsh then said, just to let you know that I saw a magpie killing a baby bag blackbird in my garden. Yeah, well, well, that that's amazing. Uh, I mean, I would love to see that, and I'm not, I'm, I am not joking. Uh, I, I have managed to 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 separate myself from nature in that respect. I have raised, I have, I have fixed, I have looked after hundreds of birds in my lifetime. Many of them, unfortunately, I'd say from cats or been hit by cars or whatever and occasionally maybe from a magpie. But magpies don't get up in the morning and say, how much evil can we rain down on the, on the world today? They're just looking for the next meal. They're just looking for food. And, and I, I think it's, it's a very traumatic thing to watch if you're very, very, very sensitive about these things, for sure. But you, you can't blame the magpie for just getting the food. Uh, and uh, and I know it's a very contentious issue, but I'm firmly on the side of just just let nature take its course. I mean, you know, uh, but but you're right. They do take young. They do take eggs. By the way, squirrels will occasionally take eggs and young, but they're so cute looking. We don't we don't have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, here's another, I guess, contentious issue or debatable issue anyway, from okay. Rory, and it's about dependency. Yes. Uh, once you start feeding birds, so they may come to expect it. And then if yeah. you forget to feed them for one or two weeks, they may get cut out. Yeah, so. I, 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 I find that my, my office in the house, uh, I, I've been moving around the house. I'm upstairs, second floor, and I've got an amazing view, like a bird's eye view looking over uh, the, the, the rooftops of, of houses nearby and that. And I, from my observations, and I may be wrong, but birds do not line up on the windowsill every morning if you take away the food. They might come and check because they know there's been food there, but they'll quickly move off and find some others. It's like, you know, the local, uh, the local cat, for example, uh, he's got like 10 different names in dead 10 different houses because they all think it's, 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 only in, it's only coming to them. But these birds will move around and find food elsewhere. Um, the, the dependency, I, I think, uh, is very low. I, I feel it's very low. I think the birds uh, are, are, are more, more clever than that and that they will go elsewhere. And I've watched birds. I've watched garden birds like finches with binoculars like five, 600, 800 meters away and they fly directly over at, a, you know, maybe 60 feet above the ground and zoom straight down onto our feeder. And then they go off and they fly off and they go zoom into another garden. So they're moving around all the time. They're, 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 they, they have a whole network of places to feed. Because if you think of it, if there was a natural food supply, they could become dependent on the one tree with the one set of berries. It doesn't have to be human uh, provided food. Uh, and if they, if they had that dependency thing, they, they'd, never, they'd never survive. They have to know that if, I, if there's no food here, I'm not just gonna spend the whole day waiting. I'm not a pet. They're not a pet in that sense. You know, they're not domesticated. Uh, they can come and go as they please. And that's what they do. So I, I wouldn't be too worried about the dependency. That's why I always tell people birds are a great pet. They're cheaper than a dog or a cat, for sure. And when you go on holidays, you don't have to have anyone to look after them necessarily. You can if you want someone to, to make sure the feeders are topped up. But I guarantee 
see you. They'll be back. They'll be back to you within within a few days when you come back and you you fill up the feeders again. Um, and of course, the thing about birds as a pet is they're I, I call them immortal, in the sense that you don't have any bald birds uh, unless they've got a disease. You you don't. They don't go grey. They don't get wrinkled. They always look the same. So when one dies, like your robin only lasts about two to three or four years. That's the average lifespan of a robin. So, and you get a new robin replacing the old one every time one dies. And you think you have the same robin for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You don't. Yeah. I'm sorry if I burst somebody's bubble there. <laughs> the, the, eldest, the oldest robin is only around 10. But the thing is, it, it might it might as well be the one robin because it represents all the robins. Uh, maybe I'm getting very philosophical here, but that's why I think having birds that you don't need any other pets in my book. They're always there. And no matter where you go in the world, there will be birds. OK, I think we take two more questions. There's a lot more questions on that, Jim, that are in here. But one that people might ask is about attracting rats and mice this is from bernie yeah. roach yeah, and yeah. how do you avoid drawing those on you yeah uh, very 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 good point i kind of alluded to it indirectly in the talk uh, four-legged friends and things like that with the baffle on on the on the on, on the uh, bird table to keep them out it, it, it can be very hard um we've had rats once in 30 years that we're in this house once once uh, but what you do is, I, I don't put food on the ground normally. The photograph I showed you there was during the, 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 the 2018 severe weather and the birds needed it. And then you, you sweep it up afterwards. I stick to, to the, the, what I showed you on the bird table, the, the seed in the fat, uh, the peanuts, uh, and, and, and that, that's really about it. You know, I, I, I don't, and the seed dispenser as well. And that has worked for me. I think keeping it, keeping it tidy. If you do get rats, well, then all, all you've got to do really, you've got to take it down. But then as I say, you can do your gardening for birds. You can put in your water, put, start putting out loads of little places like we have for water and you'll have them coming and washing. You'll still have the birds to enjoy coming and washing, coming and going, coming and taking the berries and the seeds and stuff. Uh, but I wouldn't give up. I'd take everything down for a couple of weeks because whether you like it or not, there are rats all around us all the time. Yeah. Anyone says yeah. there's no rats near them is, is, is delusional. They, they are always around. Uh, they just usually have plenty of food well away. They don't want to be near us necessarily uh, unless we leave lots of food out. So I would stick maybe to the peanut feeder on its own uh, use the bird table and put your food in the center of that so it doesn't spill out all over the place. And that will reduce the, 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 the risk of, of, of uh, uninvited guests such as rats and mice. And again, the baffle on, on, on the, the pole of, the, of the, uh, the, the bird table, you know, that little cone I showed you, that will deter them from if, they, if it's a wooden um, pole uh, from climbing up and they'll eventually go elsewhere. Uh, and uh, you won't see them in the garden at all. Okay, fantastic. So just a comment here for people who are sticking up for cats. That's where the cats are in their keep, keeping away the rats. Uh, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, cats can earn, I'm sure they, 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 they've, they've only proved it relatively recently that the spread of cats and rats are kind of intertwined going back thousands of years. Yes. As I said, I love cats, uh, but I think... I, I firmly do believe, and I remember a cat that was in, in the family a long, long time ago, and it used kill a bird almost every day. And they are not natural, the cats. These are a domesticated animal that were brought here. They're not even native to Ireland. And again, if they're kept under control in, in North America, a lot of them are kept indoor as a pet. They're an indoor pet. They're not allowed out. Uh, but if, they're, if you're letting them out, I think definitely the color... The colored collar is the way to go. They'll scare the rats off anyway, even if they can't catch them. Uh, so you won't have an issue there. Uh, but, you know, again, if you're living on a farm, sometimes you need, you know, there, there may be uh, more, more reasons for it. But definitely, I think, you know, you've got to weigh up 
are you just providing a takeaway for for the cats uh, or not? So, okay. You know, so there are and, ways of having both. And a final question. This is from Carmel. Like I said, we haven't covered all the questions, but yeah. she asks, what about the fat from the Sunday roast? Uh, I would, good question. I would tend not to use that. I wouldn't use it. It, it never goes as solid. That's part of the problem. It, if you're using a fat, you need it like lard that goes literally solid so that in the winter it doesn't go all gooey and you, if it gets on the wings of the, of the bird and everything else, it can actually lead to killing it ultimately if it gets too much. But no, please don't use the, the remains of the Sunday roast. A uh, very good question. Thanks for bringing that up. I, I should have mentioned it myself. Don't use that. Use just buy. I think it's 50 cent for a yellow pack uh, bar of, of lard. I mean, it, it, I, as I say, compared to feeding pets and looking after dogs and cats and stuff, they're, they're looking after birds is dirt cheap. Unless you, you know, put up 900 feeders in your garden, you know, but the sky's the limit, but much cheaper. And, uh, and by the way, if, if you do have questions, we have an email address, info at birdwatchcork.com. We might be able to get back to you straight away. We're a group of volunteers. But if you have any questions that we haven't answered, answered tonight, try info at birdwatchcork.com. You go to our website, birdwatchcork.com, and you'll find the contact details there. And we'd be more than happy to answer questions if we can. Okay? All right. Um, I'm just after you know, losing where I was at. So I think we call it a, call it a wrap there. Um, and um, thank you, Jim. A uh, very fascinating presentation, I'd say. And I, I, I'm sure that many of the people there have been kind of inspired by the ideas, especially what you had around feeding garden birds in a more sustainable environment. Um, and I guess as people spend more time observing uh, wildlife as well in the garden, they'll become more curious as to what the names of the birds are. Uh, and of the wildlife that, they, that, that they'll see in their garden. Um, Thank you, Tom. All right, sorry. Thanks so um, I, I just actually just want to say that I'd encourage people actually to join Birdwatch Ireland. Uh, I think it will enhance their knowledge uh, and they can also learn from more in, experienced people in the Cork branch who are always willing, as I've seen, to share their wisdom. Um, and I know that Birdwatch Ireland at the moment is going through a very difficult time uh, due to COVID and so on. Its cash flow, slow, cash flow situation uh, has put them under pretty significant uh, pressure. Um, so I think um, they carry out very important work in areas. And I think more than ever, they need uh, help from people there. And maybe there are people here who would be interested in uh, joining and I'd also encourage, I'd say, current members to resubscribe. That's actually where they lose a lot of people is, is in that area. And just to let people know, it costs 50 euros for an individual, 60 euros for a family. And I think it uh, might be a very appropriate Christmas present for nature lovers. Um, just to say as well, their online shops sell Christmas cards and they sell calendars and uh, it might be an appropriate time of the year that they actually could have a look online and see that. I think you've mentioned it. It's on www.birdwatchireland.ie. So I, on that note, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank Jim for the presentation and we'll contact you shortly again with regard to the, the next presentation. So good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome.